The last thing I want to cover in this video is a little information about the cardiac muscle itself. So hopefully you remember talking about cardiac muscle in your prerequisite class, but by way of a brief, very brief review, cardiac muscle cells are relatively short and branched. So one cell has little short branches that can attach to several other cells. And they have one nucleus, you can see here, and they are striated. So they have alternating light and dark bands caused by the arrangement of the actin and the myosin inside the cells. If any of this is leaving you confused, you should definitely review muscles from the muscle chapter of the textbook. One thing that's very important about the cardiac muscle is that it is very, very resistant to fatigue because your heart has to beat a lot every second of every minute of every hour of every day of your life your heart is beating so you don't want it to fatigue and wear out in order to resist fatigue your heart muscle depends very heavily on aerobic respiration if you remember aerobic respiration is the process that makes ATP using oxygen and mitochondria and an energy source so we need all three of those in the heart muscles first off there are a lot of mitochondria in the cardiac muscle cells. Up to 25% of a cardiac muscle cell's volume is taken up with the mitochondria, so that's good. We also need a lot of oxygen to the heart muscle cells, and that's why we have so many capillaries in the cardiac muscle, and that's why we have to have those coronary arteries to supply blood to those capillaries to make sure we get oxygen to the cardiac muscle cells. In addition to having good circulation bringing oxygen to the cells, the cardiac muscle cells also have a lot of myoglobin inside. And myoglobin is a molecule similar to hemoglobin. It binds to oxygen and stores oxygen inside the cardiac muscle cells. So even if the oxygen supply is briefly interrupted, there's still oxygen available on the myoglobin to keep those heart cells pumping. Now for an energy source, most cells in your body use glucose and cardiac muscle cells also use a lot of glucose. They store a lot of glucose in the form of glycogen inside the cardiac muscle cells. But if glucose is in short supply, your cardiac muscle cells can work on a lot of alternative energy sources as well. Things like fatty acids and amino acids can be broken down and used to make ATP for your heart muscle. If you think back to the muscle section, not only did muscles need ATP to contract, but they also needed calcium. Calcium was really the trigger molecule for muscle contraction. When calcium was released in a muscle cell, it goes to the actin and myosin and actually causes the contraction to happen. So we have to have some calcium. In heart muscle cells, some calcium is stored inside the cells in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but some of the calcium also comes into the cell from outside the cell. So we have to have calcium in our tissue fluid, in the fluid around the cardiac muscle cells, so that it can go into the cells to trigger a muscle contraction. What causes the release of calcium is a change in the membrane potential of the cell. So now we're talking about more things that you should review from your prerequisite class if you're not sure what I'm talking about. The membrane potential, remember, is the charge of the cell. When the membrane potential of the cell changes, when the charge of the cell changes, that opens calcium channels. The calcium channels let the calcium rush into the cardiac muscle cells, and then it triggers contraction. The last feature of cardiac muscle that I want to call your attention to are the junctions between the cells. The junctions between the cardiac muscle cells are called intercalated discs, and they're specialized cell junctions that are perfect for holding cardiac muscle cells together. The first thing they have are structures called interdigitating folds. It's not like the flat edge of a muscle cell goes right up against the flat edge of a muscle cell. That doesn't provide the best connection there. There's not a whole lot of connecting material. Instead, there are folds in the membrane of one muscle cell and folds in the membrane of the other muscle cell, and those folds link together, they interdigitate. Now what that does is provide a lot more surface area for the connection, you've got a stronger connection, and those cells are really gonna hold together. The second thing we have are cell junctions that provide a strong connection between cells, and those cell junctions are the adhering junctions. They connect the two cells together and they connect to the cytoskeleton of the cell so that the connection stays together even when the cells are contracting and exerting a lot of force. 
The third feature of the intercalated disks are the gap junctions. And if you remember the function of gap junctions, they open a little tunnel between two cells. So you have a cell on one side and a cell on the other, and there's a little tunnel between them. And signals can pass directly from one cell to another cell through those tunnels. Really nice for fast communication. And that's very important with cardiac muscle. Because when one cardiac muscle cell gets the signal to contract, that signal spreads through all the cardiac muscle cells and they all contract at the same time. So that's the way the heart coordinates its contraction so all the cells contract together. We'll talk more about how that signal is transferred and what happens later.